Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Benito, Steve Iadarella, and Jeffrey Zilks. Coming up on DTNS, robots get faster at learning. The U.S. tries to ban data caps. Good luck. And Justin Roby tells us why building a PC is still a good idea for some folks. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 22nd, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, the host of Roby Tech, Justin Roby. Welcome to the show. Hi. How's it going? It's I'm going excited. Great. You guys have good topics today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And one of them is you. So, you know, it, <laughs> we can't go wrong. Let us start with a few tech things you should know. Twitter announced in its earnings report that the number of daily active users rose 15.4% over last year to 237.8 million. You might say, well, it sounds good. However, revenue did not rise. In fact, it fell 1% on the year. Twitter cited advertising headwinds for the decline in revenue. Twitter also lost 35 cents a share and noted it had spent $33 million in Q2 on the proposed acquisition of the company by... What's that name? Oh, yeah. Elon Musk. Uh, the billion he'll pay will make up for that. Uh, Google has restored a section that showed app permissions in the Google Play Store. It lets users see what permissions an app can request so that you can make a decision if you want to download it and let it request that. Google had replaced it with a data safety screen, which had most of the same information, but not all. And the big difference was app permissions was computer generated. It wasn't going to make a mistake. If it was going to ask for the permission, it was there. The data safety screen was written by the developer. So you were trusting the developers to behave themselves. In other words, the permissions list couldn't be fudged or gamed. Google will now show both the data safety screen and the list of app permissions. A couple of interesting chip developments to pass along today. First, Infineon is selling the NAC1080 that can be used in smart locks without needing a battery. Gets its power from the phone that uses NFC to read it, similar to how a security badge might work. Takes a few seconds to work as it builds up power, so it's likely to be used in padlocks more often than door locks. In other chip updates, AMD posted a trailer to its YouTube channel, and then removed it, detailing AMD's noise suppression feature that uses an algorithm similar to NVIDIA RTX Voice. It also appears to be coming to AMD's Adrenaline software. Hmm. All right. Uh, Razer is selling something called the Razer Hyper Polling Dongle for users of the Viper V2 Pro wireless gaming mouse. If you pay the $30 for the dongle, it'll increase the polling rate of your mouse to 4,000 hertz. Now that's enough for some of you to go, hmm. But if you don't know, polling is, to simplify, how often the mouse tells the computer where the pointer should be on the screen. And a normal mouse might go up to around 1,000 hertz, but you can find a wireless gaming mouse that promises eight, or a wired gaming mouse that promises 8,000 hertz. So 4,000 hertz over wireless is pretty impressive. It's debatable if it makes any difference in your gaming, especially since most monitors max out at 500 hertz at the best. Uh, but hey, it's only 30 bucks. Why not try it? Microsoft confirmed it will, <clears throat> pardon me, in fact, start blocking visual basic application macros in Office apps by default as of July 27th. The company delayed the rollout in June and added more instructions for end-to-end -end users and admins on how the blocks work and how to allow trusted macros. Neowin points out that the latest Windows 11 update gives you the option to update to a newer Windows 11 version at the very first startup of Windows if your device is eligible. All right, uh, let's talk about data caps. Everybody loves them, but there's some horrible Congress people trying to stop them, Sarah. <laughs> I feel like you should strike that and reverse it. Wait, U.S. Senators, <laughs> U.S. Senators Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico and Cory Brooker of New Jersey introduced a bill called the Uncap America Act does not mean you have to take off your hats. It's not going to prohibit people from wearing stylish snapbacks. Instead, we'll prohibit data caps on high-speed broadband if it were to pass. Uh, and this is a, a exception, quote, except when tailored primarily for the purposes of reasonable network management or managing network congestion, end quote. The FCC would then be charged with developing the rules on what is considered reasonable. Now, that's an interesting proposition since most data caps exist as a financial instrument, not for an alleg any legitimate network management purpose. Data caps could theoretically ease congestion on networks if they were targeted during a time of day when networks are in heavy use. But most data caps don't do that. Most data caps are broad monthly caps that apply all the time. And so 
They don't really do a lot to reduce congestion. In fact, they may do stuff to make it worse by saying, well, if I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it only at the best time, which is when everybody else is usually using it. But the old devil lives in the details, Sarah. So how are they defining these terms? I will tell you, the bill defines a data cap the way you might expect, as a limit on the amount of bits or other units of information a customer may download or upload during a specific period of time. It defines broadband service providers by wire or radio. So this would be home and mobile services being affected here. Not bad in concept. So is it going to pass? Tom, what do you say? Uh, well, okay, before I say no, uh, <laughs> the bill does have the support of income costs, which is an industry group of ISPs that includes smaller ISPs. So if you've heard of Starry or Sonic or ZenFi, there's a bunch of them that are part of this. And they have big content providers like Google, Meta, Twitter, Netflix, and Microsoft are all part of this too. But both senators proposing the bill are from the same party. So you're probably going to have party line opposition. And all the big telcos, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, can be expected to lobby pretty hard against it. Well, here we are again. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I happen to be, uh, you know, I, I fall not, I'm not anti big telco all the time, but uh, when it comes to this, uh, this is, you know, like you said, it's, it's a, it's a financial grab. And if we're going to go ahead and redefine uh, how data caps should and should not be used and should and should not generate money, um, I would love for this to be the case. But as you mentioned, Tom, probably pretty slim that it would would pass at least without a lot of opposition from both the big companies and you know within congress it, it's a very it's a surprisingly short bill uh justin uh am i right in guessing you're in, not in favor of data caps oh yeah no i love them i mean yeah. it's my favorite thing that's why i have three isps right like it's <laughs> literally for that reason we have them because we well like we shift we literally have had issues where we've had to shift between them because of how much how much we have to do so no not a fan but like I'm kind of I'm kind of with the both of you. I just don't I just don't see this working, right? Like that's the thing. It's like there is just nothing here. And you know, anytime when you see like a like FCC or somebody like that who has to determine, like, hey, we're going to go figure out what that reasonably means, doesn't make me feel confident that they're going to figure out what that is, and that there isn't going to be some loophole, even if this does go through. Well, so. and that yeah, that's the biggest problem is is they do leave the reasonable network management provision fairly uh, open and. What we have seen over the years, say with net neutrality, is get a different member of the FCC in charge and suddenly they're changing all the rules to yep. fit their own uh, uh, way of doing things. So this could be subject to that same back and forth if you don't prescribe very clearly how to define the rules. I'm against defining rules in the legislation too clearly, sometimes because conditions change, especially in technology. Like, for instance, making USB-C the, the charging standard, you're going to have to go back and change that someday, and it's going to it's going to slow things down. Uh, yep. This is a situation where I wouldn't want to say exactly what reasonable network management is, but I'd want to set up a way where it will stay consistent no matter who's in charge of the FCC. Yeah, yeah. Why do we think uh, some of the smaller ISPs say, yeah, this is a great bill, and it's just the larger companies that have the most money that say, no, 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 this is a terrible idea. Because the smaller companies tend to not use data caps because they know they're unpopular and it helps them get customers. And it's mm -hmm. very difficult to compete with those big ISPs. So if data caps were made illegal, then suddenly there's less money going into the big ISPs and it, ge it gives these smaller ISPs a chance to say, we fought for you, come to us and, and hopefully mm -hmm. move towards leveling the playing ground. At least that's the theory. Yeah, it's it's like they can't really compete otherwise. So why not at least take the other stance from an unpopular <laughs> unpopular yeah, yeah. stance that the the big ISP is already taking? And it's kind Got of it. a no risk stance, to be honest, because yep. the chances of this passing are very low. Yep. All right, let's talk robots. Uh, robots that use machine learning to learn a new task have to learn slowly, uh, usually through a repetitious and time-consuming training process. University of California Berkeley scientists, though, have a few different ways that they're attempting to simplify and shorten that process by letting the robots watch YouTube. Sarah, what's the deal? Okay, so Berkeley scientist Stephen James explained in a TechCrunch video where he was kind of given a demonstration uh, he said, the technique we're employing is a kind of contrastive learning setup where it takes in the YouTube video, it being the robot, and it kind of patches out a bunch of areas. And the idea is that the robot is then trying to reconstruct 
that image, in this case, it's a moving image, it's a video, it has to understand what could be in those patches in order to then generate the idea of what could be behind there. It has to get a really good understanding of what's going on in the world. Now, you might say, okay, so a robot's watching a YouTube video and learning from it. How could that possibly be enough to teach a robot to do a specific task? Well, it isn't. It's not quite that simple. Human operators also move the robot in real life, either manually, you know, with their hands, or through a VR controller, uh, in addition to the video. So the video is, it's kind of like homework. It's like supplemental information. So that the robot not only observes the task being done correctly in that video, but then is guided to do the same task itself or vice versa. They just have to work in tandem. James said that product, uh, the project is showing success, noting, quote, normally it can take some, sometimes take hundreds of demos to perform a new task, whereas now we can give a handful of demos, maybe 10, and it can perform that task. Yeah, the scientists have a, a couple of other ways they're working on speeding up learning as well. Berkeley and Google brain scientist Alejandro Escontrela designs models that extract data from YouTube videos. Uh, so they take the movements of animals, people, or even other robots, and the robot decides what movements it think it can attempt itself, then tries to replicate what it watched on the videos in real life. As Contralia says, it sometimes does so well it can fool other models uh, so if they're using a generative adversarial network, it can fool one of the judge models into thinking it's not even a robot. Uh, they demonstrated a four-legged robot that learned to run like a German shepherd. I showed <laughs> it to my German shepherd. She wasn't impressed. Uh, yet. Yet. They're still working on it, though. And a final method eliminates the need for a simulator. A lot of times you train machine learning in a simulator because you can do a lot of things you can't do in real life and you can do them over and over again. Uh, but... They are able to, with one of their alg algorithms, just go straight to the real world floor. And they had a four legged robot learn to walk with the real world trial and error method in around 10 minutes. So they just put it down on the ground and it stumbled around until it figured it out. You know, the first thing I thought about when, and, and we'll have a link to the video in our show notes, it's really worth watching. I kind of couldn't really get my head around what was going on. Uh, I thought the video it, it explained it a lot better, but. It reminds me of like teaching a little kid how to do something that they've never done before. It's like the little kid uh, or, you know, someone of any age, right? You're learning something new. You watch something, you watch, some, you observe somebody doing something and you go, I want to do that. Okay. Can I do that? Now let's practice. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what they're doing with the robot. It's, it's, and because you've seen it and then you have a little instruction uh, help. Uh, Tom, when we were talking about this earlier, you were like, oh, yeah, it's like, you know, teaching a kid how to swing a baseball bat or yeah. something. You know, you might help them at first and then they get it, you know, because yeah, they seen it. One of your it. parents like puts your arms around you and then shows you like, here's how you swing. And then you start to get it. Yeah. And they, or, they literally did that with the robot picking up the cube. It was kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So that I, it, it, it makes a lot of sense because at first I was like, hold on now. <laughs> Robots just watch YouTube and then they can figure out how to do stuff. We, we're not too far off, turns out. Uh, there, there is an extra step that's involved, uh, at least in this particular research project. But wow, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's getting closer all the time. It's essentially the Matrix, right? Where basically mm. Morpheus jacked in, they watched <laughs> a bunch of videos, and then he went into a practice room and then showed him how to fight. So, yeah. And it's also the beginning of Skynet. So they won't even need us anymore. They can just watch our YouTube. They, they will uh, need us to make the YouTube videos, though. But I mean, but we're, most of them are already probably already up there. <laughs> the stuff it's like really it's like imagine know. you f you forget and leave the room, and you know that uh, YouTube is auto playing, and all of a sudden yep. the robot you know has watched like people falling off skateboards for the last ten minutes. <laughs> then it gets weird. Yeah. Yep. You got to curate that material. There's a lot of really terrible stuff on YouTube too that we probably don't want them to know. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that that is fair to point out. They didn't just let the robots watch whatever they want. They didn't let the algorithm make recommendations. <laughs> they they were selecting specific things and and to, to, to sarah's point they were actually even removing parts of the videos so that the robots would or, or the the algorithms anyway would have to figure out like oh how did it move from there to there i'm gonna i'm gonna learn that and that's how it was able to, to i am just guessing the that there are already youtube creators who are out there 
making content specifically for this, knowing that there is a new audience that's emerging for robots. And they're like, this is my market. I'm beginning here. And like figuring out what they cut out and saying, they're just going to make these videos for the robots. I mean, I mean that's I, like... Get in touch I, with I, the I, guys at Cal there that did the yeah. study, right? Yeah, not even a joke. That's actually, imagine as, as more and more people are like, you know what, robot, you don't do that well. Watch this video. Yeah, I'm <laughs> telling you, there, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. There are already creators who are already like you, like you wait it's a couple days you're already going to see those pop up for robots yeah i know you have a million views but it's all bots literally <laughs> yeah literally there's just like an androids hungry for more <laughs> show me how to do the next thing i'm ready yeah, exactly so I'm just we saying, wanted this new, bot to learn thing. how to walk but instead it made a birdhouse somehow i don't know yeah. <laughs> 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 Which is still cool. It's just not what I want. Yeah, it's 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 first. It'll be the ones who are actually taking it seriously, and then there'll be the new troll ones. I'm just wondering what the, the what the CTR rate and the uh, what like what ad is <laughs> going to show up on that, right? Like, are you lonely robot? You know what I mean? Like, there's there's a whole new whole new universe opening up right now. Would you like to accelerate your algorithm even more? <laughs> Click here. Exactly. I say we come back in ten years and see where we are on this. Yeah, agree. Uh, yeah, yeah, or be, five. <laughs> it might be ten. I know. Put I'm like ten. Down. It's, yeah. it's, it's, hopefully Robert's got it marked down already. He's already, he's already, he's already got it flagged. I'll be back in 10 years, guys. We'll look at this again. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Well, if you've been enjoy enjoyed special guest week here on DTNS, spread the word. We'd love to have you tell other folks about this fun week we've been having. Share our episode links. We're posting them on at DTNS show on Twitter and at DTNS picks. That's P I X on Instagram. You can share it with friends, family, followers, anybody that you think might get something out of all the stuff that we learned this week. Let them know they need to be listening to daily tech news show. With Intel planning on raising prices on its CPUs later this year, uh, prices of GPUs retreating from their all-time highs, uh, the current state of building a PC might seem to be a little bit in flux. Justin, as PC components r prices rise and the supplies get constricted, even if the prices come back down to earth, who benefits most from building their own PC? Well, you know, it's funny. I I literally just got finished recording a video about that article that just came out. And uh, it's it's suspect a little bit in timing because Intel says that it's going to be doing it in the fall with the launch of their new Raptor Lake CPUs more than likely. And that consumer inflation in general, it, they don't expect it to be anywhere near 20%. But when you think about building PCs, I mean, right now actually is an idyllic time to build PCs because everything is super cheap. And in fact, uh, if you look across the board, Linus, myself, Jay, everybody is essentially telling people if you're going to, if you want to build a PC and you are okay with not getting the next gen stuff, right now is the time because now it's at its cheapest and the, uh, products are ripe to basically, there's no shortages right now. Even in a lot of, I think a lot of people are still thinking that GPU flight prices are inflated, that it's really hard to get components. And um, currently in the market, it's actually not. Yeah, we've talked about the fact uh, before that that you can actually walk into a store and find GPUs on the shelves. Yeah, uh, I mean, and it's often at MSRP, even uh, depending on where you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes even below. So, yeah. who who is building a PC good for these days? Well, right now, I think it, 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 I'd say if you are in need, like if you want to upgrade, right, and you're hoping to get the latest gen, like, and I'm saying the, the latest that's starting to sunset here pretty soon, which is like 12th gen Intel, 5000 series Ryzen, you know, uh, 3000 series NVIDIA or 6000 series AMD. Now is definitely the time. And especially uh, people who are in, in, in need of upgrades for a long period of time, people getting ready to go into school. Now is a good time because a lot of the next gen stuff is really kind of going to be about like 4K and from a gaming standpoint and even a productivity standpoint, this current gen of hardware is actually really good. So if there is a need, now is actually the time. If there's, you know, and if, if you have a pretty good system and you feel like you don't need to wait, then um, I think you're going to you're going to need to bandage up that system for a while longer because prices are only going to get worse as we get into the fall, yeah. as is availability. Strike while because, the iron's hot is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what goes into building a PC these days. We have a lot of folks who have built PCs, but I know there's some of them who say, you know, it's been a while. Start with the case. What are the current trends in case design? 
Well, it's funny because I sent this along. We were talking about is the current trend in cases, and I think this is the part that's been kind of cool about YouTube is uh, especially um, in more recent, probably in the last three to five years, is that you've seen um, uh, organizations like Gamers Nexus, Jay, and those guys who've done a good job of actually starting to make case manufacturers uh, aware of what it is that consumers actually need slash want. Um, and that's, and really, so the trends like, uh, you know, I, here we have like the, the fractal pop air. Um, we've got um, the new case, um, the uh, late lean, lean land cool three that just released um, from late uh, from Lee and Lee. Um, you've got just a number of all of these cases and every single one of them are all about airflow at this point in time. So the real, the trend is, is how do I still show off the really nice, awesome RGB components while at the same time having the performance and uh, the um, heat dissipation necessary to make a PC that both looks good and performs well. And I think that's what you're seeing a lot of happening uh, in trends nowadays. So, and that's in like, even in the last like six cases that I just reviewed, it's airflow plus, you know, tempered glass, whatever. Gotcha. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the components too. Uh, let's start with hard drives. What do, what do people know, need to know about putting a drive in? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was I was looking at the show notes for that. And you were one of the questions you guys kind of asked is like, you know, are SSDs out? Um, and the thing was, is that, you know, there's been the advent of NVMe SSDs, which are these very fast um, flash type drives um, that people have been going to. And, you know, it was funny. We were doing uh, I was I was doing a stream yesterday and uh, one of our guys found a deal on a two terabyte SSD and the two terabyte SSD, which is the larger three and a half inch ones, were more expensive than some two terabyte NVMEs. And an SSD will only have like 550 megabits per second versus even the slowest NVMe SSDs are like 3,500. So most people are going to these smaller flash drives. And then really what physical, especially like big, massive storage drives are really used are for like storing cat memes or, you know, or pictures of your baseball hats or whatever it is, right? Like places that, you know, I don't necessarily want to pay for, um, you know, Google Drive or OneDrive or whatever it was, uh, but I just want to have like some sort of local storage for that stuff is really kind of uh, what you're seeing from the larger uh, physical me uh, metallic, dr uh, sorry, uh, magnetic drives. But I, I feel like SSDs are going uh, going away and everybody's kind of transitioning to NVMe SSDs um, for most of your like fast applications and, and game uh, and application storage. Now, we we're talking about building now because you might not be able to afford to build later. Should people jump on ray tracing GPUs? What What's the best strategy there? Yeah, I think ray tracing is here to stay. I mean, to be honest, I mean, uh, Intel just got finished talking, doing with their ARC. Everybody's into it. Um, and, you know, all in all, like what it does for games. So I was a before I, I got into doing tech, I was a 20 year game developer. Um, and, you know, uh, being on the edge of ray tracing. So even for for games that I worked on, whether that's age or Halo or whatever it was. Right. Like this is something that's here to stay. And ray tracing is uh, what you're seeing improvements. In fact, um, there was a leak yesterday uh, about uh, being able to play control at 160 frames per second with ray tracing on at 4K with the new 4000 series NVIDIA GPUs, right? And again, AMD has been working with FSR and their um, their tech to make sure that you can also have ray tracing. So yes, I think ray tracing is a thing. I think if you're getting a new GPU, you're going to get that already. Um, you just want to make sure that you stick with either 6000 series AMD or 3000 series NVIDIA. Don't do 2000 series or younger because, you know, all in all, that was like kind of the birth of the tech. Um, and uh, so 3000 and, and, and newer is much better. Gotcha. And then for CPUs, uh, there's essentially parity right now between Intel and AMD. Everybody's got their opinion about which one they should go to first. What about you? Well, so if you're buying right now, uh, 12th gen Intel is, is definitely the more powerful, but more power hungry and heat hungry of the two. There is, uh, but we are so close to the release of 7,000 series that I think people like there was a leapfrog, unlike 11th gen, and 5000 series 12th gen was actually there was an actual jump. So right now the current king, you know, for a couple months is 12th gen Intel uh, with AMD probably leapfrogging there. And then, of course, then Raptor Lake in October rumored um, mm -hmm. after that. So we, we're in this really interesting time where you really can choose AMD and Intel. Parity is an interesting word. Like all in all, you're not going to be in bad shape, whichever you decide. They're both great. Um, but if you want the most powerful, 12th gen is currently uh, considered the most powerful. Yeah. You just need a solar generator and you're fine. Yeah. Uh, a solar generator and an air conditioner. Yeah, right? and an air conditioner. yeah thing exactly. Is, a heat you pump. Know. Uh, before we finish this up, uh, what about parts? Where, where are your favorite places to tell people to go to find them? 
Well, I, I mean, honestly, at this point in time, uh, they're they're still the same. If you uh, the, and uh, there's a new there's a new kid on the block a little bit because uh, Best Buy, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, you can uh, get parts from Best Buy. It's the only place to get Founders Edition uh, three thousand series GPUs. Um, but most of us still get them from in, uh, Newegg, right? Mm-hmm. Even though we had the whole thing uh, happen with uh, Gamers Nexus, um, you know, it's still one of the best places. Uh, just in the fact that they have the largest kind of uh, breadth and at the same time, some of the better prices. Amazon's always a good backup. Um, it's just sometimes it's hard to want to give money to Jeff, I mean, even though he's not there anymore. He still gets or Andy. From it, but yeah, somebody gets it. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody gets it. And it's usually a lot. So it's, it, you know, pushed out some other boutique. And then new to the the other one that's kind of new is GameStop. GameStop has started selling uh, not, not along with NFTs, but also uh, PC parts um, <laughs> and their prices have started to come down. But the two primaries are Newegg. Amazon, and then of course, then you've got Best Buy there, and in a, in a little bit of a third place. Yeah, fantastic! That's great information. Thank you so much, Justin. That's awesome. Oh, you're welcome. I can go now, right? That's it. <laughs> Wait, you're <laughs> no, going to want to hear this next one. You have to listen to the future of airline travel, Justin. Uh, oh man, I'm on a plane every every week. So yeah, sure. Let's hear. Let's hear about it. All right. So after a trial run back in 2015, Alaska Airlines announced it'll start rolling out free electronic bag tags to a group of 2,500 folks on its mileage plan elite. Uh, These are customers flying out of San Jose, California to start. So, you know, it you have to be kind of a specific person, but 2,500 of you can get these for free. Instead of printing a tag at the airport, which can sometimes lead to bottlenecks, happened to me just a couple weeks ago, with these new electronic tags, you check in on your phone as usual. You say you want to check a bag. Then you hold your phone next to the tag. You transfer that data to the tag to display a barcode, kind of like how it would look if you printed it out, on the built-in e-ink display using your phone's NFC chip. The tags also have an RFID chip, which some airports already use for their automatic baggage system. So if bag gets lost, we can track it down. After the initial 2,500 elite customers get their free tags, all mileage plan members on Alaska Airlines will be able to purchase these tags in early 2023, although uh, the airline hasn't given a price for how much they'll cost yet. All right. Well, this, sorry, Are this you just, not entertained? Yeah, I, I'm just worried. Like, that's <laughs> like, I'm just like, I just feel like, I don't know if I would want, like, say for, I travel with a lot of expensive camera gear. I do not want to put something that can be written like or overridden you know what i mean i know it's a plastic thing and there's there's some some baggage handling but man i just i don't know like there's been some really interesting videos that those robots have made about nfc you know about about uh, near field communication right like i don't know that that could be interesting yeah i would i would want to know a lot more about their security uh yeah. because i'm comforted that it's e-ink right because i'm not worried that this is going to like suddenly just lose power right e-ink yep. works without power so that's a yep. great choice it's very stable unless someone tries to change it right uh i'm i'm granted you have to have physical access it's probably not uh, something that most of us have to worry about but if you are a high value target like you know somebody carrying uh known valuable equipment around you might not want to deal with this it's not like you can't go modify paper tags too uh yeah. but I, I, I'm with you. I, I would like to be comforted that this is going to have uh, better security than a paper tag and not, yeah. not equal and I or hate, less. I hate to be that guy. Like it's uh, yeah, like, yeah. I know it's like, I love cool new tech, but it just, it felt like that was the first thing I went in. There was like, I don't think I would put this on my bag with like, you know, $20,000 in camera gear on it. Right. But you know, and there's, there's, I, you know, there's something about when somebody's trying to play, change a paper tag, it'll, you know, they're bending over, but there's just, sometimes there's the ability, right. Like just to, just do, to do things technologically yeah. and, yeah, you don't even know something has happened. I don't know. And again, I think it's, it's not, rad, though. I think, I it's, think cool. it's not so much about uh, it being picked up by the wrong person at the carousel, because that could happen anyway, right? Yeah. Nobody checks those tags. It's about like having it routed somewhere that you could then run a scam or yeah, yeah. or something like that. I mean, but it's cool to see, right? Like it's. I, I mean, I, I was excited at first, but then you know, I started going down the dark, the dark world of you know, just yeah. hey, not my stuff. It, it would take a lot to to make it get routed to a place that if you were not already an employee who could steal it anyway, that 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 would be advantageous. So maybe it's not as bad as we're thinking, but it, no. it does give me it does give me pause. I will I will yeah. agree with you. All right, let's check out the mailbag, Sarah. Uh, let's do it. This one, uh, was, uh, one of our patrons, David sent us a note about the company Gated's idea for reducing spam by making spammers donate to charity in order to reach your email inbox. Talked about it yesterday. David says, I work for a medium sized nonprofit. Perhaps a funny way to use Gated would be to earmark your own nonprofit and then use the system across corporate email. 
Also, I hope this doesn't just move the bottleneck to where it has that validate thing, Tom, that Tom mentioned as the alternative to pain. In other words, a script spammers write just fills that in with their junk phishing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, David says, I do think it would eliminate a ton of spam just by round robin approach since I can see a situation where the origin from line is spoofed. I assume that's still a thing. Yeah, it totally is still a thing. I, I still want to know that that verification procedure. I can't imagine it's easy to get around or the whole gated system would just not be worth it. And people are signing up for it. So I just need to find out how that works. And I can't sign up for it because the, the place is swamped. Uh, but I love this idea of a nonprofit going, wait, we could get people to have to donate to us to get into our email. That's amazing. Let's do it. Uh, well done, David. Good, good thinking. Also, good thinking from you, Justin Roby, and thanks for being with us today and bringing the knowledge. Let folks know where they can keep up with all that you do. Oh, yeah. Well, it's actually pretty easy. It's at Roby Tech absolutely everywhere. Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Roby, uh, uh, Twitch. So the good thing is I got I actually got it everywhere, so which is always good to go. So, yeah, we uh, we, we live stream builds uh, almost every day. And then uh, you can always catch YouTube videos that come out on our second channel um, pretty much uh, once or twice or three times a week. Right. Plus TikTok content, Instagram content and all that stuff as well. Very cool. I uh, want to give a special thanks to one of our lifetime supporters, top lifetime supporters, Matt Thompson. Yeah. Is, is who we're thanking today. Thank you for all the years of support uh, with us. Yeah. And thanks for being part of the team, Matt. The way you become the next Matt Thompson and get thanked like this on the show is to become a patron right now. Do it. That's right. Yeah. There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. If you're a patron, you already know all about it. But if you're interested, it's available at patreon.com slash DTNS. We roll into it right when we wrap up this show. But this show is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. We're always on demand. But if you want to watch live or listen, find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back on Monday with Terrence Gaines. Have a great weekend, everyone. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host producer and writer Tom Merritt. Host producer and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and master booker this week, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S. One. Bye. Cow, Captain Kipper, Gadget Virtuoso, Steve Godorama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's shows include Scott Johnson, and guests on this week's show included Jack Resider, Will Smith, Quinn Nelson, Joel Telling, and Justin Roby. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>